Baltimore, gentlemen. The gods will not save you. You think I have time to ask a man why he giving me money or where he gets his money from? The game is out there, and it's either play or get played. You come at the K, you best not miss. Welcome to this BFI at home to celebrate the 20th anniversary of one of the greatest TV shows of all time, The Wire, which we call All the Pieces Matter. My name is Amon Woman, and I'm a contributing editor at Empire Magazine. We were lucky enough to catch up with many of the original cast of The Wire, and I got to ask them some of the questions I had always wanted to ask them, including how did Lester Freeman get that amazing nickname? Was it always on the page or was it just an improv on the day? answers are forthcoming. The people that I got to speak to were Dominic West, Wendell Pierce, Clark Peters, Jim True Frost, Lance Reddick, Jamie Hector, Andre Royo, and David Simon. Let's hear what they had to say. Uh, good to see you guys. I'm gonna jump right in. For some reason, The Wire was not immediately popular do you remember when you first realized the show was connecting with audiences? For me, here in America, it was um, after the second season, we started to realize that people had, we had a loyal following. Um, and that was going into the third season. And it was in the third season that we felt as though we had captured one aspect of the audience. And that was gonna be ours and that was gonna be unique and um, it might grow, it might not grow. It wasn't until after the show went off the air that I started to realize that it was growing more and more and more. And then um, that it went to another height when uh, President Obama said that it was uh, his favorite show. And that's when I realized, wow, it's gonna have an impact a lot longer than the years that we, uh, we did it. But while we were shooting, the first time I saw the episode, I was with, uh, Andre Royo and uh, Sonia Dusan and I said, man, save your money because we're going to be canceled. <laughs> you know, this is not going anywhere. Uh, it was so different. Um, but it wasn't until after the show and President Obama really, that's when I, it, it woke me up to, wow, I didn't realize it had that far of a reach and impact. Yeah. Dominic, I was reading that your agent told you the show was only going to last one season. Is that is that true? Well, I think he was trying to calm me down. You know, I was going, I was going, look, I don't know what I'm doing here. I think they've, they've miscast it. I had my usual sort of uh, imposter syndrome. And uh, he, so he kept saying, you know, don't worry. When we won't, it won't go past the pilot and then it won't go past season one. And, and he wasn't, you know, uh, he, he wasn't, talk, you know, just talking bullshit because they had to fight for every season. David had to fight for every season. And we weren't any of us ever sure, A, whether the next script was going to be um, about our death, our fictional death, or, or even whether we were going to come back for, for another season. And, uh, and it, I, you know, I remember law enforcement and, and people who were depicted in the show were always fans. And I got to see that from airport security or thing, you know, because I kept coming home to the UK. But it was only in you know, after four or five seasons when uh, I remember whatever the recognition we were getting in America that when I came home, no one had seen it or heard of it. And then I was in a sort of road rage incident in Kilburn in London, where I started shouting at a guy to get his car out the, the way. And it was a hot day and I was upset or whatever. And he, I was going, come on, just move your, move your stupid car, you know, like this. And he leant out the window and he went, you're McNulty. And that was the <laughs> first time I realized that it, that it, that it had connected, um, across the pond and and uh and it was uh it was kind of um embarrassing but but delightful <laughs> i love that so one of the many legacies of the show is its relevance in today's world has there been any particular episode that has stuck out to you for whatever reason given all the madness that's been going on in the last few years wendell not any one particular episode i i think of the show in general overall um uh, the impact of uh, showing the dysfunction of the police department, especially um, to expose Comstat, which was, you know, just doing whatever you could to try to cook the book or get good numbers so that you could look uh, uh, better than you are um, doing. 
And, uh, you know, someone attacked me during this reckoning and saying that, you know, you're on the wire, you celebrate all of this misconduct uh, by police, you do this uh, celebration of all the police brutality and all. And I said, well, you obviously did not watch the wire. It was not a celebration of it. It was a, a condemnation of it. It was showing the dysfunction that exists in the police department and how uh, those who are trying to do good, those individuals who are trying to do well, uh, lose their way because of the system as a whole. And it called into question that system and how that system needs to be reformed. Um, and so it plays a vital part in the discussions of what we're having today. It gives people the blueprint of uh, what, where we need to start the discussions and where, what we need to advocate for and what we need to advocate against. Uh, I always say that we were the cautionary tale and it comes down to one line that sticks in my head the most, um, which is I've repeated it so many times today, uh, the bigger the lie, the more they bleed. And that's mm -hmm. to talk about the cover up that have been happening. Um, uh, the lie that has perpetuated that, uh, you know, this hero worship of cops that can do no wrong, that there isn't a systematic and ongoing uh, behavior where cops are um, acting improperly and brutalizing people and in many cases killing people. And so uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we shine that light on that misdeed and misconduct um, because that's the role of art where we reflect on who we are as a society, declare what our values are and then maybe act on them. Maybe we have moved some people to do it. To have Navalny, uh, the, the Russian dissident who's going to prison, quote the show as he is sentenced to more years in prison um, uh, was just mind blowing to me. So it just shows you the impact of The Wire 20 years later. Absolutely. Uh, I can't let you go without asking about the fuck scene because honestly you guys deserve a medal to yourselves for getting through that without bursting into laughter every 10 seconds how was it when you saw that in the script and then filming it on the day how many takes did it take to get you through all of that i'm pretty sure we did burst into laughter quite a lot during, <laughs> during the taking of it um but i i yeah i mean it was uh it was uh it was it, it was <laughs> What was funny was that it was seemed more artificial than obviously more artificial than most scenes that we'd done till then, which to me seemed you know gritty, naturalistic uh, writing and acting, and that was um, that was that was very much a sort of a well-known acting exercise of, of, of uh, Wendell was talking about earlier of um, the gibberish scene where you where your intentions have to be so clear that it doesn't matter what you're saying, but also a writing exercise, and so I I was concerned that it might come across as too artificial, but um, but I think a lot of it relied on our chemistry together, and and that was never in doubt from from my audition with, when which Wendell was at, and and um, from from that time onwards, I it was I always found it incredibly easy to act with Wendell, and and um, because he's an intensely not just good but an intensely generous uh, actor and man, human being. So so that I have very warm memories of shooting that day, and and. Whenever we did a scene together, it was it went faster than any other scene. And the feeling is mutual. Dominic is very generous, very loving. Um, he has a huge capacity to joy, which is uh, uh, it's infectious. Uh, and when he speaks to you, you are the center of the world. And we just played off of each other very well. Uh, and our chemistry was there from the minute we met in the audition and uh, throughout those five years of, uh, of shooting the show uh, and continues today because I, you know, caught the train south of London to celebrate his birthday, his daughter's birthday, and, you know, handing out cash to all of his kids because I don't know which one is my god child. So, <laughs> a whole lot. Um, and uh, it was just really nice when I was doing Death of a Salesman in London to have him come and see it. Uh, I was proud to have him there. And, he sent friends and family to see it. And uh, now that I'm about to do it on Broadway, it's uh, I, I, it was a gift that he gave me of support that, you know, I think uh, made the show successful and uh, encourages me to go on with my work. I really appreciate Dominic. 
Uh, I'm going to jump right in here, guys. Uh, Clark, I don't think anybody else on the wire can say this. You have the coolest nickname of any character on the show, Cool Lester Smooth, uh, which is just <laughs> awesome. Was it always that way on the page? How did that come to be? That was that was uh, Kima. That was Kima's line, you know. Uh, I think she dropped that. And, uh, and I picked it up, and I'm still running with it. <laughs> <laughs> it just fits the character to a T. I love it. Uh, Jim, I love Prez's evolution over the course of this series because he starts off as like a bit of a screw-up cop. Then he gets really, really good at the job, and we're rooting for him, and then he uh, ultimately becomes a teacher. Do you have a, uh, a version of Prez that was your favorite to play? Yeah, you know, I, the, the, the most fun I had was was as a teacher. I mean, that season was just so satisfying and so interesting, and I had so much to do. Um, but I, I'd say that the, the middle section was the most uh, interesting or, you know, kind of e fun to chew on because there was that transition happening where he'd been in such disrepute you know he'd been such a screw up and then he he get, became useful and he was actively learning he was just eating up what Freeman's character had to teach him so uh I'd say that was kind of like the most dynamic time yeah absolutely um Lars one of the mega one of the many legacies of the show is its relevance in today's world um and there's a number of scenes that I think of especially given everything that's been happening over the last few years especially when it comes to Daniels that scene where Daniels covers for his detectors by making up a fake story hits especially hard today. Uh, do you remember filming that scene and have you thought about it in the years since? Wow, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, whenever I, th I haven't thought about this scene in a while, but whenever I think about this scene, I never think about um, its, its relevance to kind of today. Um, Cause at the time it just, um, I was thinking of it artistically, not politically. Mm. So uh, it was just about uh, finding the character's uh, loyalty to his people, kind of no matter what. That that was really the only thing I was thinking about it. And I the funny the other th funny thing about that scene is that um, it was it was sometime in Jan January February, and it was so cold that by the time we finally got to got to my coverage, uh, my face was starting to kind of freeze. So it was I was having a hard time saying the words. So if you watch watch the scene closely, I'm kind of. <laughs> I'm kind of a little mush mouth trying to get the words out with that monologue. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to be visit that scene. <laughs> I'm going to take on a whole new light after that information. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that. Um, Clark, one of the things that distinguishes Lester from other characters is, is that he remains more or less pure for the entire series. Did you ever have any conversations with David Simon about that? Um, not with David, but I did with Ed. Um, when we get into the into the uh, into the fifth season, he begins to do some uncharacteristic things. Um, he's going along with McNulty's plan um, to, um, but it makes you wonder um, what got him into trouble in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that although he's all pristine and all that, you wonder well what put his ass in the in the pawn shop to begin with, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was um, it was following that money that did it, you know. Um, so there's a, I'm 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 sorry, man. I I I, I lost track of your question because actually a whole bunch of other things started coming to my mind at the same time. Uh, and one in particular is the man who it was based on, the mm. character that uh, that Freeman is based on, who I didn't meet until the last day of our shoot. I'm glad I didn't, you know. Um, He's now a sheriff, you know, in the, in, but uh, he was a man who was correct, doing the right thing and trying to, and trying to maintain the law accurately and got shafted, you know. Um, question for uh, you, Lance, as you wrap up here. Uh, each season has a different theme. If there was a season six, what would the theme be in your mind? What? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would have gone international. Um, okay. And in season two, right, where we're down at the docks, right, um, and the boats, uh, uh, um, the van is put into one of the containers and shipped all over the place, right? At the end of that season, uh, we came back, at the end of the season, season's over and done with, um, 
there was a raid on Patapsco. Mm -hmm. And that raid on Patapsco, was, they, were looking for, um, they were looking for arms mm -hmm. because it was just the beginning of the, whole, of the whole terrorist thing going on. They were looking for arms. I thought that would have been a fine, a fine uh, um, uh, season six to go internationally, to look at terrorism, you know, to look because the drug war we know is redundant, but the terrorist war, the war on terrorism seemed to be a, uh, um, a thing to follow at that point in time. But I have to say that the war on terrorism is just as elusive as the war on drugs is actually, you know, because who's a terrorist? Uh, Andre, Jamie, lovely to meet you. I'm going to jump right in. Uh, Andre, I read that you initially didn't want to play Bubbles because you didn't want to play a stereotypical character. Why did you ultimately ultimately decide to play him? And what are you most proud of when it comes to Bubbles' evolution over the course of the show? Um, yeah, I didn't. I was just doing theater. I thought theater was, you know, born and raised in New York, and I thought theater was my arc of where I wanted to end up. And when my manager called and said, HBO has a new show. I got excited because HBO is the joint. But they were like, oh, so it's a, a show called The Wire and a character named Bubbles. And I just was like, Pookie, are we doing Huggy Bear? Like, are we still doing this type of joint? I just saw Sam Jackson and Gator and Chris Rock and Pookie. And, I, and deep down, I also didn't think I, I could mess with those guys. I, like, I didn't think I could add anything else that they, those guys did. So I didn't want to play it. And then my manager, being a smooth New Yorker herself, was like, Oh, it's not an offer. It's an audition. How about you go and get the part? And she made it kind of a challenge. I was like, wait, I'll get the part. And then when I, you know, when I got there and I had auditioned like five times, when you audition five times, all of a sudden you realize, no, I want that motherfucking part. Like, I want to know who's better. Who, who's doing better than me right now? And I met David Simon, met Ed Burns, Alexa Fogel, and they, the people behind this show, it felt different. And again, HBO felt different. So... Once by the, by the fifth audition, yeah, I wanted the part. I changed my mind. I ate crow. <laughs> and I was like, yo, I, I need to be a part of this show because it felt different. I think we are all glad that you changed your mind. Uh, so thank you for doing so. Uh, Jamie, you know, one of the best things about this show is Omar, played by the incredible Michael K. Williams, who we unfortunately lost a few months ago. I know that you shared many scenes with him. Are there any particularly fond memories that you have of working with him on the show? <laughs> Now, you know what? All of my scenes with Mike, you know, when Mike walk up on the set, it's exciting, right? It's, it, like he walks in the scene, it's, it's lit. So when you get a chance to share the screen with him, then it's all great. It's off the screen, the moments that we shared together, that was really, really fantastic to me also. That's memorable, right? I mean, I remember first meeting Mike. I shared this story before my first, I think it was my first day on set. And you know, there's something about Brooklyn boys when you see them. I'm not talking about them Bronx. Dudes, right? I love no, you're not. Not, no, I know you're not. I know you're not. I, I know you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Man, <but love it. laughs> so, but well, you know, when you see a Brooklyn boy, you, it's like things change. It's like, so I automatically felt that I knew him. One, two, when you're a new artist coming on the set and you watch the work, you feel like you know the actors, but you realize they don't know you. So you approach them in a different way, like, oh man, you start talking, they're just looking at you, you know, like. <laughs> that was a moment where I approached Mike and I was like, Mike, what's going on, man? I'm from Brooklyn, you from Brooklyn, what's up? And, and, he, and he looks at me and he takes a drag of his stove and he's like, just don't argue about the wardrobe, man. And walks away. I'm like, <laughs> and Drake know what I'm talking about. I mean, he, gave, he dropped the gem, right? He dropped the gem, just don't argue about the, he dropped the gem. You look like Omar Little. <laughs> yeah. okay. He was just like, he looked and he's like, man, just, just, just don't argue about the wardrobe, man. Just, you know, just wear what they give you. And I said, oh, okay. But that was a moment for me because even him not knowing me, even him looking at me, even us not really ever spending time together, he dropped the jewel, kept it moving. And I still was able to see his authenticity and a true person as to who he was, man. A, a true, genuine brother, authentic brother. Love yeah. him. Fearless, yeah. No, he was definitely one of one. Uh, I love Marlo as a character, by the way. He's so interesting. And one of the best moments that he gets is that is that my name is my name speech. Um, because we're not used to hearing Marlo raise his voice, but he does in that scene. When you read that scene, did you immediately know that you were gonna play it the way you did? No, not at all. I, I tell everyone it was a whisper from Nina. Mm. And it was a moment, right? We're in there, and it was a whisper from Nina in her comparison to. Um, my name 
see it as if it's a person, a corporation, IBM, Amazon obviously wasn't around at that time, but you name it. And their company, their business is being dragged through the mud and they find out. And that was it for me. Cause then I was like, oh, so, you know, you value yourself at that level. This is Marlowe. He looks at himself as a business, as a corporation, one that's seeking power, one that's gonna get the power by any means necessary. Um, and if everyone is talking about him and it's only a matter of time for that business to be chopped down from the room. And now it's, now I need to know. And that's how, that's when I approached it at that point. I worked on it, clearly didn't know how it was gonna turn out. And then it just happened to turn out like that. And I guess, you know, you're aware later on that he never raised his voice. I, I wasn't really aware of that. Like that wasn't something that I really focused on. But then when you find out that everyone is like, he never raised his voice. So because he raised his voice, that means that he was very serious and passionate about what he was saying at that moment. And that was about his name, about, about, about everything that he values. Um, Andre, uh, each season of The Wire has a different theme. If there was ever a season six, what would the theme be in your mind? Good question. Theme, oh, um, you know, we, we, covered, we covered so many angles within each theme. I, I think for me, we want, I think it's a little biased because I talked to David a little bit. I, I think social reform and all the, you know, the protests and activism, I think that was going to come into play. And then I, 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 would, I would believe if we're going to do authenticity, you know, hip hop and music was going to play into the drug game because mm -hmm. I just feel like that's what happened naturally with a lot of, you know, people in the business. They moved on to hip hop being the new source of supply and demand and took the streets. I see, I see the Marlo character, you know, all of a sudden being Birdman of Baltimore and, and bringing in acts, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I think those are the two that I probably would have saw if there was a season six. I know Bubbles was not going to be in drugs no more. He was going to be drug. He was going to stay drug free. <laughs> With light now to be joined by David Simon. Uh, for some reason, The Wire was not immediately popular. Do you remember when you first realized the show was really connecting with audiences? We were off the air already. <laughs> <laughs> That's the honest truth. Our numbers continued to decline after season two. Uh, and we, we, we came in on fumes. Uh, we landed that plane on fumes with, uh, with very few people watching on, on, on Sunday night on our original broadcast. Um, what happened was, um, well, first it happened in Europe. Um, and it happened largely in the UK. Uh, I, I can credit you, you guys for, um, it worked. It worked. Uh, and the reason I think it worked was America's a pretty diffuse place. We have 360 million people, you know, in, in various regions and with various urban centers and uh, we're big and we spread out. Um, you guys are 40 million people, 20 million of which are um, basically oriented towards the same greater metropolitan area of London. And I think what happened was it was classic word of mouth. People started watching the show um, and organically they talked to other people about it and everybody was sort of frequenting, frequenting some part of the same urban world. Mm -hmm. um, and so it actually took off and, and was more of a hit in overseas in some ways than, than it was mm -hmm. in America. We, our numbers were going down and it was going up over, you know, in Europe. Um, and and that, that's very real. And then the second thing that happened was the box sets of DVDs, which uh, nobody will remember this, but they didn't, HBO didn't even bother putting them out until after season two, three seasons had already aired. And it was only in advance of the fourth season that they finally got the box set of season one onto the shelves. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason was nobody was watching the show that it was not a priority for them. They were, they were rushing to get the Sopranos and Sex and the City and other things that were selling uh, into people's hands. So this was kind of a loss leader. And, and what happened was at some point, the word of mouth at least had the benefit of binge watching of this new phenomenon where instead of it being appointment television, you watch an episode on, and then you, you go to the water cooler and talk to people about it. People were watching it on their own terms and at, at their own speed. And the binge watching of those first three seasons on, on, you know, finally caught up, caught the show up. By then we were done making the show and we were, on, we were doing other business. Mm. But um, I do remember the, the one moment where somebody showed me a, a sales sheet uh, for HBO for War Time Warner. And uh, we had sold 10 million units of The Wire in, in six months. And I thought to myself, 
to who? <laughs> watching this show when nobody was watching it. What you know? What's happening? But you know, it was a word of mouth. It really came from word of mouth, and it took longer in the U.S. because you know, just because three guys in Milwaukee have figured out they like the show doesn't mean that they get to talk to three guys in, in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. And so, in some ways, um, there was some benefit to I think the U.K. being more of a. I'm not saying you guys are completely homogenous to London. I understand you, but but there is a a predisposition to, you know, when something, something gets talked about, it gets talked about mm. a lot faster and a lot more aggressively, I think, where you're at. We're happy to help, David, anytime. Uh, <laughs> one of the many legacies of the show is its relevance in today's world. Has there been any particular episode, I guess, that stuck out to you for whatever reason, given everything that's happened in the last few years? And are there any particular episode or episodes that you direct people to uh, when uh, talk of the wire comes up, if they haven't seen that, I guess. I don't know about episodes. You know, I don't rewatch the show. You know, tear out the rearview mirrors is the only way to get new work done. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't. I haven't gone back and watched the show, and I don't know what's in what episode um, until somebody tells me. Um, mm-hmm. But um, but I will say, uh, there's a lot that we understood about what had gone wrong with our country when we wrote the wire. We were coming off of those first fundamental scandals of people selling shit and calling it gold, mm. of people selling nothing. Um, we, were, we were coming off of Enron and WorldCom and, and, you know, in some other greater sort of social cultural moment, the Catholic Church uh, being revealed to have, you know, moved all their priests around to avoid the responsibility for all of the, um, the child abuse. Um, all of that was going on. When we when we penned the first episode, so we the sense of, of an America that can no longer recognize its problems, much less deal with any of them, and 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 an America where that which was worth nothing was heralded and that which was valuable was disregarded, mm-hmm. that was the tone that we we wrote the, the we wrote that for that country, um, and we remain that country, and so I think that stuff still resonates. I think when you get to a line like um, we you know you know what the problem is, Brucey, we used to we used to dodge it here we used to make shit now we just put our hands in the next guy's pocket that's still the problem in the west that's that's still the problem uh and and the idea of you know i can i can look out this window right here in the um the grain pier that that used to be a derelict grain pier in season two that we um we magically made into the new condominium development at the end to service the haves at the expenses at the expense of the working class that was a conjured um conjured future that we created out of whole cloth. At the time we filmed that in Baltimore, that was a, that was a grain pier and it needed to be repaired. Uh, I could look out this window now, I could turn this computer and show it to you and, and it, that would be a luxury condominium now called Silo Point. Um, it happened uh, and it happened for almost a, you know, maybe two, three years after the wire um, finished its run. So mm. we were guessing, but uh, I think we guessed at some stuff correctly. Absolutely. Uh, each season of The Wire has a different theme. If there was ever a season six, what would that theme be? Well, every time I answer this question, it gets called season six. And that's the mistake. Because mm-hmm. the truth is season five has to be season five. Because the critique of our media culture is a critique of us. It's not just, we're not just critiquing reporters. We're critiquing the consumers of our, of our narratives and our, our media. And, and we wanted to turn the camera back on all of us, you know, all of us Americans or all of us in the West in some way and say, when all these other problems of the previous seasons were happening, when this is what was becoming of our society, what were we paying attention to? And what, what, what did we, you know, what, what excited us and what got us um, riled and what, you know, since we're ignoring all of this, what were we doing and what were we telling ourselves? And so that, I wanted that to be the last, um, I wanted that to be the coda, the last piece of the, of the, um, of the city building. So that had to be six. And if that has to be six, then season four has to be five because the two are connected by all the bodies in the vacants, you know, the, the Marlowe narrative. So when I say I'm going to add, I, I would add a season if I had a chance, uh, I'm really talking about a season four after okay. season three, but before you start the run of five and six. And the one that I would have done, and I have to credit my late friend and collaborator, David Mills, he came up with this idea, unfortunately too late for me to pitch it to HBO because by then I barely talked my way back into four and five and I couldn't go back to them. But he came up with the idea of um, immigration. 
and the, the importance of immigration and, and our views of it in America as a nation of immigrants who nonetheless um, are extremely uncomfortable and extremely phobic about whichever new wave of immigrants are, are, are landing on our shores. Um, that, that push me, pull me dynamic and, and how much, it, how destruct, destructive it is to the American psyche and how hypocritical, hypocritical it is. Um, that, that could have made a lot, you know, and, and here in Baltimore, we were seeing a, an influx belatedly. A lot of American cities saw this earlier, but it came late to Baltimore, an influx of Latino um, cohorts, you know, Central Americans, and Mexicans, uh, who, um, who were taking over, not taking over, they were, they were settling in, in otherwise more urban parts of Southeast Baltimore. So there was an interesting dynamic actually happening on the ground. And it would have been a chance to speak to the the American relationship with immigration, mm. um, which I think is important. So we missed that one. And I would love to have done that as season four, not tacked on to the end, but season four. I would love to have watched it. Um, each uh, season of The Wire, the opening credits is soundtrack by Way Down in the Hole, um, which is a very catchy track. I've actually been re-watching the series recently, and it's been in my head for a while. But did you always know that you were going to stick with that track through all five seasons? and do you have a favorite rendition? Yeah, uh, I don't have a favorite rendition. They all sort of work for each. I mean, I think maybe the first, just because um, it was the first, and, uh, and there's something fun about the uh, Blind Boys of Alabama, do, you know, delivering it as as gospel. Particularly since it's, I think it's done in a very sardonic way by Tom Waits. It's it's a song that is, I I don't think it's steeped in a. Uh, how should I say this? I don't. I don't. I I think there's a little bit of sacrilege to his. His, his read on religion. Um, uh, but I think they, they, they take it and make it, they do, they do their own thing. I mean, yeah, we knew we were going to do it and we knew we were going to do it differently. We originally were looking at a, a Waits song. I'm an admirer of Tom Waits uh, uh, mm-hmm. called um, Get Behind the Mule. Um, but some of the verses didn't quite work. We couldn't, we couldn't quite marry the, you don't want the lyrics to land perfectly on what you're trying to say, or it's, it becomes redundant but you also don't want them veering too, veering too far away. Right. So we tried to make that one work and eventually um, we went to uh, way down in the hole. Um, a funny story about that is that right when the show was right at the edge of, of broadcast and, and we still hadn't, Waits had not approved the use of the song and, and mm-hmm. we'd, sent, we'd sent him episodes and the, the cut, the cut, you know, he saw the cut of the, um, how we were using it in the credits, but we weren't getting any response at all. So finally, our post-production um, producer, uh, she uh, she called him. She <laughs> got a number from the, the, his agents were desperate to get an answer, and she 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 got a number and she called him. And in classic Waits fashion, and I've told this story many times, and I, I hope it's okay with him that I tell it. But <laughs> he uh, um, he told her, "Oh, you know, I, I know I have those tapes around here somewhere, and I'm supposed to look at, but I don't know how to make the VHS player work. <laughs> I don't know how to do this." <laughs> Let me let me talk to maybe when my wife gets home, she knows how to work the machine. <laughs> Twenty four hours later, he approved it. So <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you, Mrs. Waits. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> For reals. Uh, so now, twenty years on from the show, what would you like to say to the cast today? Well, I'll say what I often said to you when we were making the show, which is that someday, uh, many years in the future, um, you would be trying to explain the meaning of your life and your purpose. Um, to some seemingly sympathetic stranger and you're trying to get your head around what your life meant and you might look up at that man and say, um, you know, I was once on a show uh, called The Wire and that I was almost sure even back then when we were making the show that that man would look at you and say, that's really great, sir, but it's 2 a.m. You need to finish your drink and get out of here. (laughs) A huge thanks to the cast of The Wire for chatting with us. If you have enjoyed this discussion, the BFI is a charity organization and details on how to donate will appear very shortly. Make sure you check out my discussion with the creator of The Wire himself, David Simon, also available here on the BFI YouTube channel.